and you're ready to go. Enjoy your session. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so welcome to the last uh, session, last technical session from TCC to 2020. Uh, so my name is Ignacio Cascudo and I am one of the chairs of this session together with Marshall Ball. And um, the first talk is uh, going to be given by Chen Yuan. And it's a paper with uh, Ronald Kramer and uh, Chao Ping Xin called On the Complexity of Arithmetic Secret Sharing. So, yeah, whenever you are ready. Yeah, yeah I'm ready. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Nacho. Yeah. So, yeah, today my Excuse talk Excuse me, is, uh, you're, you're a little hard to hear. Can you either yeah. move oh, your okay. microphone closer to your mouth or increase your audio level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm also, yeah, because it's deep in night, in the, at night. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay. So okay, can, can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Yes. I, I just raised my voice. Okay. Good. Okay. So yeah, let's let's, let's start talk. Uh, my uh, yeah, my talk is on the complexity of our smack secretary, and this is a joint work with Ronald Kramer and Xin Chao Ping. Okay. So first, uh, let's look at uh, the linear secretary scheme. So this is the definition of linear sequential scheme. Uh, first, we have a sharing scheme and a reconstruction scheme. Uh, for a linear sequential scheme, uh, the sharing scheme, I mean, given a sequent S belongs to some FQ and finite field, and uh, we will generate N shares. And these N shares and have uh, um, satisfied these uh, um, requirements. First, it has T privacy, which means that uh, for any T of these uh, T shares, it implies nothing about the sequent S. Also, it is satisfied this R reconstruction, which means that uh, for reconstruction scheme, given any T shares, and it, it, the reconstruction scheme will recover the share. Uh, besides these uh, um, these two um, these two um, requirements, um, these these two features, and uh, there are also another feature called the linearity. So if we have two two sequent X and Y, and also the shares X one to the X n, Y one to the Y n. And, and then we, we, we can say that uh, X plus lambda Y is uh, also a valid, is a circuit correspond to the shares X1 plus lambda Y1 and to the XN plus lambda YN. So this is called the, the linear sequential scheme. This is a definition of linear sequential scheme. Uh, next, we go to the arithmetic sequential scheme. Uh, what is the arithmetic sequential scheme? Uh, it's also, it's, uh, first, it is a linear sequential scheme. But besides linear sequential scheme, we require that such scheme has a T strongly multiplicative. Uh, what is T strongly multiplicative? First, I mean, this sequential scheme must, must have T privacy. And besides T privacy, and if we have two sequent X and Y, and they are share x1 to the xn, y1 to the yn. So the component wise product of the circuit x times y and uh, can be recovered from any n minus t share uh, shares. So if our sequential scheme has this property, we call it a t strongly multiplicative. Um, so also we are interested in the asymptotically good sequential scheme. Uh, so for asymptotic group sequential scheme, which means that uh, uh, if we have a sequent space and which is a t, t, t dimensional, and also we have uh, a sequent space, sorry, it's L dimensional, and also the privacy T, they are both linear in N, where N goes infinite and Q is fixed. And so if they are also positive constant, we call it uh, asymptotic group sequential scheme. Uh, so this is uh, the definition of arithmetic sequential scheme, and uh, let's go to. We have some now results about how to construct a symbolic good this strongly multiplicative arithmetic sequential scheme. Also, this scheme must uh, be defined over the finite fixed finite field. Uh, so the scheme, uh, the current construction we know, I mean, they must derive from the algebraic geometry code, and also the shear and the reconstruction scheme can be are efficient both running polynomial time. And so there are another, I mean, some drawback uh, for this uh, construction because we use algebraic geometry code and uh, there will be a big gap uh, in the number of parties uh, if we go from one scheme to another scheme because asymptotic, sec good, uh, asymptotic good sequential scheme implies that there are a family of sequential schemes. And uh, so for, for, for each sequential scheme, I mean, it has a fixed number of players. And, but to adjacent sequential scheme, the player number is not, uh, uh, it's, it's not very close. So usually there will be some big gap. If the gap is big, and actually we will lose some performance uh, during, I mean, if you want to apply it to any number of players. So you have to cut some of the shares. 
cut off some of the shares that will affect the performance. So a big gap is not good. Um, so the other new result, uh, our uh, there are new result from in, the, in our paper, and also we present uh, a new construction of asymptotic good t strongly multiplicity of arithmetic sequential scheme also it's over any finite field, and this sequential scheme. And uh, so the one, uh, the first uh, merit of our sequential scheme is that our sharing and reconstruct scheme reign cosy linear time, and uh, for the previous scheme, and because it's a uh, it, it derived from algebraic geometry code. So there are schemes and uh, the encoding and the, the encoding and decoding of uh, algebraic geometry code is at least uh, quadratic. So so it, it, it cannot be approached this uh, cosy linear time. And uh, the second benefit is the gap in the number of parties n is negligible compared to n. So yeah, so we, we have we actually a very small gap. And the, the third merit is that the construction only relies on the existence of asymptotically good algebraic geometry codes instead of its uh, algebraic structure. So we don't need to know exactly what this algebraic geometry code is, but uh, we, all, we, we only need to know the, the existence of this code. Actually, we what we need to know is uh, the existence of a asymptotically good arithmetic sequential scheme, well, which also we, we only know the, the only construction we know is from this algebraic geometry code, but we only, only know the existence of this code and we can find it efficiently. So this is uh, the our, is our result. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about our constructions. And actually we have three, bu three, three building blocks. Uh, the first building block is a variant of Shamir sequential scheme with sequential space over a large field. And uh, the shared space is over a small field. And uh, because it's a Shamir sequential scheme, and uh, we, we, can, we can make this sequential scheme shared and reconstructed in cosy linear time. And so the, the, the second building block is a concatenation. We have defined concatenation of two arithmetic sequential scheme. So this and uh, this concatenation will give rise to a new arithmetic sequential scheme. And uh, if this uh, if the two arithmetic sequential scheme and the concatenated are uh, strongly uh, are strongly multiplicative, and uh, the new sequential arithmetic sequential scheme is also strongly multiplicative. And uh, the third uh, and the third building block is a reverse, which is called a reverse multiplication friendly embeddings. So, what is the function of this embedding? And it can split a circuit over FQ uh, over a very big field into a circuit over a small field. But uh, actually, there are many circuits. It's not only one circuit, but many circuits, but in a small field. And uh, while uh, so it's keeping it, it will keeps the multiplication property. So this and uh, this result comes from the. Um, for another, uh, for a crypto 18th paper. So yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, basically it's our results. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if anyone has questions, either uh, here in this chat or in Tulip. Um, so, I don't see any for now, so let me let me just ask. Uh, so uh, I've I've looked at at your paper and uh, it said that uh, I mean the results at least are uh, are stated for um, constant size fields, but still not all fields because I mean you need that this uh, Q is uh, an even power and that Q is large enough. Um, I suppose, I mean, you said in the talk that it's for any finite field, so I suppose that you can uh, still adapt the construction to any finite field or? Uh, yeah, for this question, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I guess we, we, we can do it for any finite field, Q, even if Q is two, but uh, this means that uh, we need uh, I mean, maybe more, one more layer of concatenation because so we, if we go down from, uh, small q to f2 actually i think it's just like uh, your previous work uh, i mean i mean just doing the concatenation apply the concatenation multiplication multiplication friendly embeddings uh, to the sequential scheme and uh, so to to bring down the the uh, the i mean the bring down the finite field si size from F fq to the f2 and uh, it, it needs one more layers uh, of concatenation yeah i guess we, yeah, yeah we we can achieve f2 yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, okay. As, and uh, besides, uh, besides, uh, yeah, if you look at uh, our 
paper, it says, it says that we, if we have two uh, artifact sequential scheme, and one scheme is defined over F2, and the one scheme is defined over, over a big field, and this concatenation will give the sequential scheme over F2. So, so as long as we have our respect sequential scheme over F2, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. Also, this respect sequential scheme is a, a inner scheme. So it's it, it's a very small lens has a small lens. We so we can do we can find it in a in a polynomial time or even in a linear time. So we, we don't. Uh, uh, care too much about uh, I mean just uh, if uh, how to find it as long as we know it's the existence of this scheme and we can use it to uh, to do the concatenation. So this uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't uh, see uh, any any other questions. If anyone has a question, just press. <laughs> Or, uh, but uh, meanwhile, maybe you can set up for the for the next talk. Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I, I first I stop the sharing and okay. yeah, this is my... so you are getting praised for the nice work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um. Yeah. Uh, so I can introduce uh, Chen again. Uh, so he's going to be talking about uh, this joint work with uh, Sergey Bell on uh, robust secret sharing with almost optimal share size and security against uh, uh, rushing adversaries. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. Uh, yeah, this is a joint work research for. Uh, it's about a robust secret sharing scheme. Okay, so let's first look at uh, what uh, is the robust equation scheme. Uh, so for robust equation scheme, we have uh, a two honest dealer and the honest reconstructor and n parties. So this is basically the set settings of uh, this robust equation scheme. And uh, first, uh, giving the secret S to the dealer, and the dealer will generate n shares. Each share goes to one party. And so for um, assume that there are some party was corrupted. For example, the PN is corrupted. Uh, uh, then, and when during the, during the reconstruction phase, uh, the, the party corrupted party will send a corrupted share. For example, in this case, SN tuta is corrupted share. So when the, the owner stock reconstructor received the N shares from N party, and he will try to reconstruct, recover the sacred S so if, if he succeed, and we say that this uh, secret sharing scheme is robust, and uh, yeah, of course, I mean, it, 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 we, we must assume that uh, the corrupted party is uh, not too many. If uh, there are too many corrupt party, yeah, the reconstruction can always fail to re recover the secret. So yeah, this is basically the, the, the idea of this robust secret sharing scheme. So what is the robust secret sharing scheme? Uh, let's for look at its formal definition. And first we have a secret S and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we given the secret S and it will generate N shares. And so for the when the adversary and uh, he can, uh, what, what can adversary do? And uh, for the uh, adversary, he can control uh, up to, for example, up to T corrupted party. And then also oh, there's some, some comments. Can you remove? Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what this is. It sounds like some. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I, I will stop sharing and. Uh, sorry, sorry. I will. Like the. What was the. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. great, great. So, sorry, sorry. But, yeah, because because I I I didn't stop sharing and the sharing reshare another screen. It might count. Yeah, yeah. Of, of some problems. Sorry. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. 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 Okay. So 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 yeah. Let's look at the definition of this robust sequential scheme. And so this is kind of a, I assume that the adversary he can corrupt T parties. So yeah, so when once and the, the first step is the general end shares and the adversary where he can when he he control some of the shares, when he control the shares, he look he can he uh, control the parties. When he control the party, he can look at the shares, corrupt it, 
and and the way and the, so during uh, the robust we have this robust car reconstruction so we have we can recover it from this uh, from the end shear uh, from end shears up to t shear uh, up to t shears is corrupted and there are some interesting cases and is the threshold case and equals 50 plus one well. so the 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 other uh, the corrupted party is uh, is less is less than just, just, um, I mean that the owner's party is uh, outnum outnumber the uh, the the crowd party just by one. So this is the threshold case and uh, also the most interesting case. Uh, during this uh, in this threshold case and uh, we can and, and it's it's the reverse equation scheme is possible if we allow some small number a small error probability. And also there are some also we also we we are care about this uh, overhead. Yeah, we want a small overhead in the share size. Uh, so yeah, so let uh, in this in this work uh, we 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 concern this uh, Russian adversary model. So we just say uh, talk a little bit about this Russian adversary. So what is what the Russian adversary can do? And first uh, he he can he can select parties to corrupt. And uh, when he corrupt the party, he can see the all the shares held by the corrupted party. So and and as the other, um, I mean, it's even if uh, there's no Russian adversary, he can do the first thing. And the, the, the se second thing is that he can see the community transmission between honest party and the reconstructor. And the, uh, this is uh, only the Russian adversary can do. For non-Russian adversary, he cannot see the transmission between the honest party and the, the reconstructor. So Russian adversary is more powerful than non-Russian adversary. Also based on this, trans uh, based on the transmission he saw, and he can, he can he will modify his uh, shares and send it to the reconstructor. So this is uh, basically the power of Russian adversary. Okay, so there are some now results. Uh, so the first result is against the non-Russian adversary. It can achieve the optimal share size. The overhead is optimal, and it's only only related to the kappa. Kappa is the security parameter. So there are also log n. I mean, hidden in this, uh, uh, in in this, uh, in this, uh, in in this column. In the, in the kappa in the in the big O tutor, but uh, yeah, it's not uh, it's very small, so we, we assume that it's optimal. And also the other uh, a paper, um, our previous approach, and we uh, we achieved the security. Uh, we have we achieved the security against the Russian Russian adversary, but uh, our overhead is uh, is not optimal. It achieves kappa times n to the epsilon. Epsilon is a very it can be any small constant, but uh, it's not log n. So it's not optimal, and uh, so there are for Russian adversary. There are, we also know know there's the construction achieved optimal overhead. So the I mean there are the, the there are two in, the independent works. Uh, and the first and the one work appears in this uh, crypto 2020s paper. Uh, they are, they they have I mean they they have better constant around the complexity but the required communication between parties. So, so they are, both of our works achieved optimal overhead, but uh, we have we take diff completely different approach. So because our approach are different, so we have, uh, there's also some, I mean, some performance, uh, we have actually different performance. So in their works and uh, they achieved, uh, I mean, they are, they are constant, their round complexity is better, but uh, they require communication between parties. Our work, we, are, we only require communication between parties as the constructor, but we our round complexity is uh, a little bit higher than he, there. They achieve two round complexity. We have five rounds. So basically this is the difference between our two works. Um, so I, I just say a little bit about this new approach. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 and so yeah, we, 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 we also realized on our previous paper and we have uh, in our previous paper, we have two algorithms. One algorithm is a graph algorithm and another algorithm is a list decoding algorithm. So yeah, we, we first we we have uh, some we we defined uh, as kind of passive parties and the, the number of passive and we divide cases according to the number of passive parties. If it's small and we use graph algorithm to handle the small case. If it's big, we use the list decoding algorithm. But in, in this paper, we replace this list decoding algorithm with a new algorithm, and this new algorithm and it, it can enumerate the number of party passive parties p from from n over log n to n over two, so this enumeration gives us extra powers to uh, I mean to 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 find out uh, the the corrupted parties, and also we also we reuse the candidate emission algorithm in our previous approach to spot the right uh, code word from a list of candidates. Yeah, it's basically the, our new approach. 
Okay, so yeah, it's it's just a, a very 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 <laughs> basic. Uh, it's, it's just an overview of our new approach. And thank you for your attention. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So yeah, again, uh, questions uh, you can ask directly or in the chat uh, here or on the the Zulip chat. In the meantime, uh, I guess so. Uh, is the log n factors are these log n factors necessary? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's necessary. Yeah, you, the, okay. yeah. You can prove uh, uh, some lower kind of lower bound. Uh, you, you must have log n factors. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, do you need at least two rounds, or can, is there a possibility of getting even fewer? Uh, uh yeah, two round is uh, is the lower bound uh, because if for one round, actually, uh, in there are two thousand papers. I remember not. Only one round, the the share size is at least uh, the share overhead in share size at least O n. So O yeah, you cannot achieve better than O n if you have one round and two rounds, and you have log yeah, you can achieve log n. So yeah, basically, the two round beats one round. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's for one round, it's like some coding problem. So it's a, it's like yeah. kind of error correction code and some kind, yeah, basically, yeah, have this kind of feelings, yeah. Yeah, so I guess that there are no more questions. Uh, so, um, so maybe we can go to the next talk. Um, so if uh, maybe you can stop sharing. Yeah, I will stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the next talk is uh, secret sharing schemes for almost all access structures and graphs. And it's by uh, Amos Weimel and uh, Udal Farras. Um, and Amos will be uh, giving the talk. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, depending on your time zone. I'm Amos. Uh, Oriol was supposed to give this talk, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Now I'll be speaking about secret sharing schemes for almost all access structures and graphs. So let's start by recalling the definition of a secret sharing scheme. So secret sharing scheme is a method to, uh, to protect a secret. We have a secret held by some dealers and then N parties. What the dealer does, he prepares N strings called shares and he gives the first share S1 to the first party, the second one to the second party and so on. And so we have two requirements. The first requirement says that uh, if you have an off-white subset of parties, they can uh, pull up, uh, they can uh, together reconstruct the secret from the shared. And we have an access structure, which is simply the collection or the specification of which uh, uh, sets are off-white. So off-white sets can uh, reconstruct the secret. And we require that every set that is not off-white is prohibited, meaning that the uh, prohibited subset uh, has uh, absolutely no information uh, about the secret. So uh, this is a secret sharing scheme. And uh, what is known about secret sharing scheme for general access structures. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, in the previous two talks, we spoke, we, we heard about the uh, special secret sharing schemes that were defined by Black and Shamir. Eton, Saito, Nishiziki defined this uh, problem of uh, secret sharing for general access structures. And they presented the two secret sharing schemes in which the share size was, uh, two, uh, for, in the worst case, was two to the n. There were some uh, follow-up work that presented the more efficient uh, works. They are more efficient for certain uh, uh, families of access structures, but in general, uh, the share size uh, in these schemes uh, is still two to the n. And for 30 years, two to the n was uh, the best secret sh sharing known. And uh, we didn't know if we can uh, do better. And then uh, two years ago, 
Leon weg, then Kunatan uh, showed that uh, things can be uh, improved. In a breakthrough paper, they showed that uh, there's a scheme in which the share size is two to the power of 994n. So it's two to the c to n for some constant c that is smaller than one. And then in two follow-up works, uh, we showed that this can be improved. And the best uh, secret sharing scheme known to date was uh, Applebaum, Nier, and Peter. We showed that uh, we can do it with two to the power of 0.64n. So it's still exponential, but the exponent is uh, smaller. So this is the upper bound. And since the upper bound are, uh, is exponential, one can uh, hope for good lower bound. But the, the best lower bound was uh, proved uh, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. 20 years ago. Uh, so uh, the best lower bound is the uh, omega of n log n. So the upper bound is exponential, the lower bound is less than linear, and there's a huge gap between the upper and lower bound. And the question is, uh, what is the true share size required for sharing a, a secret for a general uh, access structure? And this is a big, huge open problem, and nobody knows the, the answer. So what do we, uh, so the previous bounds uh, were, the construction world for the worst case. For all access structures, the, 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 the scheme was in which the share size is uh, two to the CN for some uh, C smaller than one. But, uh, and what we should study, what is the share size required for almost all access structures? And this is inspired by two uh, results. In complexity theory, many times almost all objects are hardest. If you speak about circuit complexity, most uh, functions require exponential size uh, circuits. So in complexity, most objects are hard. In uh, contrast, in com combinatorics, sometimes almost all uh, objects are easy. For instance, uh, if you take a random graph, so the size of the uh, maximal in the maximum independent set is log n, and the other one can be n. So in con combinatorics, uh, almost all object can be easy. And what do we do for secret sharing scheme? We uh, give a better upper bound for share size uh, for almost all access structures. So uh, uh, for almost all access structures, the uh, size of a share is uh, two to the O tilde of square root of n. So it's uh, not uh, order of n, but order of square root n. And for almost all graph access structures, uh, graph access structures, uh, a graph in which uh, all minimal of y sets are size two, uh, we give a, a scheme for almost all graphs in which the share size is uh, n to the power of small o of one compared to n for, uh, for the worst case uh, graph that is what's known. And we also give some uh, better lower bound for almost all uh, access structures. I'll uh, present more details about uh, our upper bounds. I won't go into detail about uh, a lower bound, but first let's uh, speak about our construction. So the, mo the most important tool that we use uh, to uh, construct the, the schemes is the robust condition disclosure of secrets. Uh, condition disclosure of secrets were, were used uh, uh, in previous work for, uh, to construct uh, secret chain schemes and in a, the stock 20 paper, we define robust uh, condition disclosure of secrets, and we use them to uh, construct the strings for almost all uh, uh, graphs uh, access structure. And we use the properties of uh, almost all access structures and almost all graphs. So we use the properties of monotone Boolean, of uh, random monotone Boolean functions and uh, random graph. And, uh, we use the math weights uh, for the proof of the lower bound. Okay, so let's speak about a hint about how we prove the upper bound. So uh, we construct the secret sharing scheme with smaller share size for almost all access structures, the size two to the over, order O tilde of square root of n. And we do that by combining two results. Uh, one result says that uh, for almost all monotone Boolean functions or almost all monotone access structures, the size of the, the minute term, the minimal of y sets 
is only n over two plus minus two. So all uh, minimal authorized sets are very close to being uh, of size n over two. And once we have this uh, result, we can use the secret chain scheme of uh, LV uh, to uh, realize them with the shared size reformist. So uh, this result is simply a combination of uh, two uh, known results. So this is the result for uh, almost all access structures. What, uh, let's move to a graph secret chain scheme. So a graph secret chain scheme is a access structure is a realized access structure in which all minimal sets are of size two. They can be real, represented by a graph where each uh, edge represents a minimal of a set. So uh, for instance, uh, we have an edge between one and two, so P1 and P2 can reconstruct the secret. And of course, uh, the access structure is monotone, so if one and two can reconstruct the secret, so also one, two, and four can reconstruct the secret. On the other hand, Every maximal authorized, uh, every maxim, every maximal independent set uh, cannot uh, reconstruct this, uh, that uh, will not have any information on the secret. So, uh, for instance, in this case, two, three, and four uh, is a prohibited uh, set. So, edges and sets that contain edges are authorized, and independent sets are sets uh, uh, that cannot uh, that are not allowed to learn information about the secret. So this is a graph uh, secret sharing scheme. So uh, the best known secret sharing scheme for graph, the, the, the trivial secret sharing scheme for graph will share the secret independently for each edge and the shared size will be order of N. The, it, this was a, a, a slightly improved to N over log N using the result of uh, version fiber of covering of a graph. So uh, the upper bound is N over log N and the best law of one is omega of log n. Again, there's a huge gap between the upper bound and the lower bound, and we don't know what the true share size for graph. And the graph secret chain schemes are very simple secret access structures. Uh, many times, uh, people first prove the result for graph access structures, and then they were generalized for. Uh, general access structure. So using, uh, studying them gives us intuition and what, uh, for the correct result for general access structure. So these are very uh, interesting uh, access structures. And uh, it's a very irritating uh, family of access structures. What do I mean by irritating? For all, uh, for most other families of access structures there have been a uh, improvement in uh, using the result in the last two years. For forbidden graph, for CDS, which are connected to uh, secret chain schemes, and for all uh, for all access structures, there have been improvement. For secret for graph secret chain schemes, uh, although uh, people tried, there wasn't any improvement uh, over the result from 20 years ago, and still the best uh, upper bound is a uh, nearly order of n. So we don't have any improvement on them, and uh, it's not known. I don't know why we don't have an improvement, but uh, it's not known what the true share size of these uh, access structures. And what we study is the uh, most, uh, what is the share size for most uh, graphs. So uh, what we construct is a secret sharing scheme uh, for graph, uh, the smaller share size for almost all graphs, and the share size will be n to the small order of one. So it, it, it will be uh, something that is very small. And how do we do that? Our construction, we first define a GT secret chain scheme. So again, the off -right sets are sets that contain a Z and sets of size at least T plus one. So we have a more off -right sets and the prohibited sets are independent sets of size smaller than T. So we have a parameter T and the uh, there are less prohibited sets, so this access structure is uh, simpler than a, a secret chain scheme. And uh, what we uh, we construct a secret chain scheme for the for these uh, 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 GT secret chain schemes using T robust uh, control uh, CDS protocol, and the share size of these teams will be T times n of small o of one. So we, for, uh, we have T times N over one, and 
Now we use the fact that uh, the size of the largest independent set of almost all graphs is the order of log n. So if we take uh, order of log n robust uh, uh, g, gt for t order of log n, we'll get uh, it's something that uh, realizes both uh, graphs. And the size will be log n times uh, t to the over of one, uh, of one, which is uh, n of to the power of order of one. Okay, so this uh, concludes my talk. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see any for now. I guess I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, what is? What is a? What are your lower bounds? What is the improvement? Okay. Uh, so it's known. It was the no, the lower bound is for linear secret sharing schemes. It was known that for every finite field, most access structures require exponential size uh, shares. So for every field, most access structures are hard. What we do, we, we reverse the order of quantifiers. We show that for almost, for almost all access structures are hard over all fields. So uh, theoretically, it was possible that for some fields, uh, so for every access structure, there would be some, uh, some, things, uh, some fields that it would be easy over the, for that uh, access structure. And we prove that it's not possible. And just to clarify, your schemes are, your upper bounds are not linear. So, we have a lot, I didn't mention that at all, but we have a upper bound uh, using the same ideas. We improve also the upper bound for linear schemes. I simply for this presentation, uh, I didn't mention them. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I guess there doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, yeah, I guess if there aren't any more questions, then uh, Alfred, do you want to uh, set up? Uh, yeah, start sure. Sharing? So uh, Alfred Grossman is going to be uh, telling us about uh, transparent error correcting in a computationally bounded world. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Justin Holmgren and Elon Yogev. Um, one second, I'm getting some security issues on my computer with sharing screen. So I have to restart Zoom one sec. You may want to go on to the next talk if he's having trouble. Sure. Uh, George, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. OK. Did I share my screen then? Uh, yeah. OK. All right. Sorry. Oh, 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 OK. Wait. Oh. Oh. There we go. Back. Can everyone see it? Maybe. Can people see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. All right cool. Yes. All right. Great. So yeah, I'll be talking about error correction in a computationally bounded world, and this is joint with Justin Holmgren and Elon Yogev. All right. Cool. So basically, the what we start talking about is error correcting codes. So error correcting codes, hopefully, a lot of us are familiar with. Right, so an error correcting code is basically a pair of efficient algorithms, an encoding algorithm and a decoding algorithm, with the goal that when you take a message, you encode it and add errors, then you can decode it and come up with the original message. So you have a message, you encode it, and then even if some adversary adds some errors, you'll still be able to decode the original message from it. Cool. And roughly when constructing these, these codes, there's kind of two parameters in tension. Like on the one hand, you want your error rate to be high. You want your code to be able to withstand a lot of errors. And then on the other hand, you also don't want your encoding to blow up the message too much, right? So the encoding adds redundancy and you don't want to add way too much redundancy. And so 
when we deal with error correcting codes, we kind of try to get like as ideal as possible a trade-off between this error rate and the data rate. And in general, when we talk about these error correcting codes in the context of these Hamming codes or the worst, like these worst case adversary codes, like the good thing is that they're very versatile in the sense that we don't have any assumptions on the noise, right? So on these codes, no matter what noise you have, as long as it's a small enough fraction of the positions, you'll be able to decode it and get your original message. Now, the issue with this, on the other hand, is that these assumptions can be overly stringent. So for example, in some situations, you might know something about like your errors. For example, your errors are random or they're like whatever adversary is creating the errors, you know some facts about it. And that can help you get better like error rate to data rate trade-offs. So that's the idea. So roughly like from a cryptographic point of view, I think that makes sense to do is to talk about um, adversaries that choose your message and errors that are a polynomial time algorithm, right? So in general, like whatever process it is that created your message was probably or was likely computationally bounded and whatever process it is that added errors is also likely computationally bounded. So in those situations, you might, like you might not need the Hamming codes that give you guarantees about like any errors, but it's enough for you to just deal with polynomial time algorithms or like something computationally weak adding errors. So these kind of codes have already been, been studied before and our result is, is improving what's known. So here's the result written down. Basically like for certain parameters, we construct these codes that are public coin and stateless. So for these parameters, like in, in a second, I'll, I'll kind of like explain what these parameters mean exactly. But the idea is this stuff before was known to uh, be doable if you have like a private key and a stateful uh, setting. So the sender and the receiver, whoever is decoding and encoding, they're gonna share some private key and the encoder needs to have a state that he updates every time he sends a message. And so we kind of just make it public coin and stateless. So we lower the setup assumptions. Let's kind of explain um, what the, the bounds we get, the parameters we get. So here you can kind of see in red, it's like what the, the best possible trade-offs for Hamming. And the, in the green, it's like for, for random errors, right? And in blue is for pseudo Hamming errors. So you can see, for example, in the large alphabets, that what we do is we, we kind of match random errors up to a certain point and then we, we drop to zero. So kind of you can think about it as if your error rate is fewer than, than half, so fewer than half of your entries get corrupted, then just knowing that your adversary is computationally bounded means you can get as good of error correcting codes as you could if your adversary was completely random, was, was just uniformly randomly picking entries to corrupt. And you can see in the binary alphabet, it's kind of the same story except the blue doesn't actually like doesn't actually hit the green. So for binary alphabets, we can't quite get up to random errors, but we still improve over the Hamming. Cool. All right, let's let's give a like one minute idea of what the, what our approach is. So our approach is we start with good list decodable codes. So list decodable codes are this idea of um, an error correcting code where instead of when decoding, getting your original message, you get a short list that contains the original message. So it's a certain generalization or relaxation of error correcting codes. And the idea is we know how to construct these list decodable codes with, with better rates than, than for uh, like normal uniquely decodable codes. And then we modify them to have what we call high pseudo distance. So a high pseudo distance roughly is a code where it's hard to find two code words that are close. So there might be code words that are close to each other, but it's just hard to find them, right? With pol within polynomial time, it's, it's unlikely you'll find any. And then we show that any code that's list decodable and has high pseudo distance is also a good pseudo Hamming code. Um, yeah. So yeah, we start with list decodable codes, we modify them, and then we show that after we modify them to have high pseudo distance, we get exactly what we want. We get things that are pseudo Hamming. So they're good against any polynomial time adversary. So yeah, that's the five minute version. Happy to take questions. Okay. Oh, 
Looks like there's a question on the chat from uh, Prashant. What computational assumptions do you use? Yeah, great question. Cool. So the computational assumptions that we use is we need to get um, uh, two input correlation intractability for a certain uh, for a certain relation. The relation is a little hard to describe. So this computational assumption isn't something we like know how to create from standard assumptions. I think in in the in the longer talk, I think like I the one open problem I mentioned is like how to make to do this with more standard cryptographic assumptions. So the thing we have, we can instantiate it with a, like a, in the random Oracle model, but all the stuff we know right now about constructing two input correlation intractability isn't actually good enough to construct it for the specific relation that we want. Um, do, you, do you have any sense of what minimal assumptions are, would be in this regime? Uh, like what is um, necessary? Or if there are any? Uh, let me think. Yeah, nothing nothing comes to mind right away. I haven't I haven't like thought about this a ton. But I I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's possible to show that this like implies something. But I don't know any. It's worth noting that if, if you get like, um, so for the stateful thing, right? So before us, people did it with uh, secret keys and stateful and over there, they just use one-way functions. So their, their assumptions are much more reasonable. So an intuition why uh, for binary calls, you don't get all the way to, to the bound for random errors? Is yeah, yeah. Yep, so the idea is, is, so in our approach, what we do is we start with these list decodable codes and then we modify them. And basically the reason we match random for high alphabets is because it's known, like other people have figured out how to create list decodable codes that match this random bound. And for binary alphabets, it's still not known how to do it. So I think, I think we can show like, if you found a, a list decodable code in the binary world that matches it, then our techniques will immediately immediately work. Um, more questions? Uh, well, Benny has a comment just that uh, he thinks it would imply constant round uh, statistical hiding commitments. That seems that seems plausible. Though I would probably have to check before promising. Yeah. Thanks, Benny. Okay. Okay, so if there Thank are you. no more yeah. questions, yeah, thanks. All right, awesome. Thanks. Um, and maybe yours can set up for the next talk. Uh, uh, hello, does the screen share work? Yeah, yes, it does. So uh, the next talk is uh, new techniques in uh, replica encodings with uh, client set setup. And uh, it's a paper by uh, Rashid Garg, um, George Liu and uh, Brent Waters. And George is going to give the talk. Okay. Uh, hello. So yeah, I'm George. And so we can start by going over what replica encodings are. Um, these are, this is a concept that was introduced in a paper by uh, Damgard, Ganesh, and Orlandi last year. And pretty much in this primitive, you have a client with a message, and they want to produce a couple replicas of this message, where from each individual replica, you can recover the original message publicly. But if you have an adversary, and they, and you let them like look at all the replicas, 
they shouldn't be able to compress them down and sort of store them in less space, significantly less space than the total original size of the replicas. And the, I guess the intention of introducing this primitive was to have some applications in uh, decentralized file storage. Um, so in this uh, original DGO paper, they propose a construction from trapdoor permutations, random oracles, and uh, invertible random oracles. And basically how it goes is we take the message, uh, we split it into a bunch of uh, blocks which match the domain size of our trapdoor permutation. And then we just we start by uh, XORing it with the output of the random oracle with a short random string and the index of the block. And then we just feed that through the invertible random oracle, through the uh, inverse of the trapdoor permutation, and so on. And once we've done this enough times, we take this final YR, YR block and we collect this for all the blocks and we include this with the random string row. And this is our replica encoding. And you can see that, you know, in order to recover the original message, you can sort of work backwards. And since that only requires evaluating the chapter of permutation in the public, in the forward direction, this is all doable publicly. Right. Uh, and so in this original paper, uh, they claim that they claim that if you set rounds in equal to omega of the security parameter times the number of replicas, this is a secure replica encoding scheme. And uh, our first result is a uh, lower bound on this uh, sort of construction, where if you set the rounds, the rounds must be at least linear to the number of replicas times the number of uh, blocks per replica. Um, but so actually, if you look at this. This uh, sort of contradicts the original theorem of the the theorem of the original paper, and I'll like quickly go over why uh, this is true by sort of going over our uh, the proof of this fact. And so with the way we prove this is we we construct a particular trapdoor permutation, and then like explicit adversary which can attack it um, using sort of a very like low sort of low space. And to do this, we just take like any trapdoor permutation except um, in addition to the regular public key. We also attach a obfuscated program that helps invert the trapdoor permutation. Um, but of course, we also require that they sort of certify that they already know the, the outputs that they're requesting um, in the form of taking the XOR of all the inputs that they want to invert. And so you can see that if so like such an adversary wants to sort of recover the trapdoor permutation, recover the replica encoding, when they if they just try, want to like recover, uh, recreate the steps in computing the replica encoding um, in order to invert when they normally need the, when they normally need the secret key, instead they could just use this obfuscated program and this small XOR which they can, which they'll store. And this sort of highlights a flaw in the analysis in the original paper where they assume some sort of additivity in the amount of uh, space needed to invert multiple random instances of a trapdoor permutation. Uh, but the good news is that if we actually, if we just uh, up the round count to scale with the number of blocks per replica, this is actually uh, still a secure replica encoding scheme. Uh, and I'll go over in a little bit how we show that. But I'd also like to mention that uh, there was concurrent work by Moran Wicks, which also uh, noticed this issue with in the original work and also constructed a version of replica encoding schemes using um, different techniques. And yeah, they call them uh, incompressible encodings. Uh, and so to, pro to prove the security of this, uh, this just a uh, reparameterized construction, we sort of have to come up with some new, uh, implement some new proof techniques because the original uh, paper relied pretty heavily on this assumption. And so the way we do this, is that first we show a property called sequentiality, where for an adversary to be successful with all but negligible prob probability, they need to query these Ys on some block, they need to query these like Y0 blocks in order. Uh, and then after that, we show a switching property where if the adversary was successful if this uh, adversary with like bounded like input space is successful on 
on this sequential block, then it should also be the case that with high probability, there is some, there's some location where we can switch this block with a random element and the adversary should still win. And uh, after, we, showed, after the, we show both of these, we can use the sort of adversary in the last game to invert a arbitrary uh, input on the chapter permutation by just sort of looking at its random oracle queries. Uh, and then I'd also like to mention that we also, using the same sort of technique, we can uh, prove this is prove a construction of uh, replica encodings um, in just the random oracle model without invertible random oracles using the same uh, proof framework. Uh, and that'll be it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, are there any questions? So I guess that um, so 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 what you you show uh, about the the paper by by uh, Dan Gordon at, at all is that um, at least you cannot uh, get the result if you use just an arbitrary uh, trapdoor permutation is is that right? So I guess in the original paper they have this assumption, or yeah, they assume just uh, normal trapdoor permutations, but we show that. Um, I guess if you assume indistinguishability obfuscation, we can construct mm -hmm. a particular chapter of permutation for which this is not the case. Right, and any intuition if it's it may work for other trapdoor permutations? Uh, or? I guess yeah. So it's not entirely clear if this would work in for like if you instantiated with like RSA or something in particular. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a question in the in the chat. Uh, so, so Richard, do you want to to ask the, the question? Sure. Um, I was quite taken by the Feistel network in your last slide, uh, which prompts me to ask: Is this your result extensible to all Feistel networks? Uh, sorry. So, what do you mean by that? Well, you showed uh, a Feistel network as an instantiation of your technique. Right. Um, right. So we. So I guess. No, so I guess we're, we're we in particular we're proving like, um, like, a modification of the original construction where we, rather than using an invertible random oracle, we use some, some like Feistel network like structure that only uses a random oracle, um, is also a replica encoding scheme. Uh, I guess I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Could any Feistel network be used as your oracle? Is there any constraint, like, um, the basic Feistel network is a three-way switch, right? Right. Uh, and then you have rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds and all sorts of other complications. But so, but your result would apply to any Feistel network? Uh, no, no. We we show this for like a particular concrete like construction of like, I guess simply substitute like we we substitute essentially we substitute the invertible random oracle for like a sort of like a just like one round Feistel um, network, and but like I guess we used to have to iterate it with the uh, chapter permutation. Uh, every time. Uh, sorry, with the yeah, with the trapper permutation every time. Uh, I guess it's not clear that um, a modif like a different Feistel network construction would still work. Um, yeah, that's the question. Right. I guess my I guess my answer is this is not something like we don't explicitly show anything like this, but um, I guess it's possible. That's all. Thanks. Um, yeah, Thanks, so, George. yeah, I guess yeah. there are no, no other questions. Um, 
Yeah, if that's the case, then I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Eshan, who uh, will be talking about uh, non malleable codes, extractors, and secret sharing for interleaved tampering and composition of tampering. Um, and this is a paper that's with uh, Shinli as well. Um, thanks, Marshall. Uh, <clears throat> so my screen is visible, right? And you can hear me fine? Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about um, a bunch of things, non malleable codes, extractors, and secret sharing in new models of tampering. And this is joint work with um, Shin Lee. And actually in this short talk, I'll just be focusing on non malleable codes. For more details on extractors and secret sharing, do check out the longer talk. Okay, so let's start off with recalling what non malleable codes are. This is a beautiful notion introduced in 2010. Um, so, okay, so this generalizes and relaxes the notion of error correcting codes in the following way that you have a message S that you want to transmit over a noisy channel. Um, so you encode it, um, you add redundancies, and then you think of the noisy channel as some adversary acting on it and dampering it. And this adversary is from some class F. So C is tampered to C prime and um, you decode this tampered code word. And the relaxed notion that you want is the following. So this is the requirement that either you get back, um, you know, your original message S, or you get back something S prime, which is completely unrelated to your message. So this is the relaxation. Um, so you do not allow the adversary to, you know, you do not, the adversary cannot force you to, you know, decode a message of their choice. And the hope is that, you know, this weaker requirement rather than, you know, unique decoding or list decoding and so on. Um, so this is a much weaker requirement and you hope that for this weaker requirement, you can actually handle much more general forms of tampering than just, you know, uh, closeness and having distance. Okay, um, so more formally, to capture this notion of unrelatedness, well, what we say is you allow the encoder to be randomized. And DF is a distribution which is independent of the randomness of the encoder or the message that you start with. And you want that either, so now, you know, the decoded message is, is a distribution over the space of messages. Um, and you want either that you decode back to your original message or um, it's from a dis it's sampled from this distribution df which does not depend on your original message so this is the way you capture unrelatedness all right um, so given this definition okay so and the closeness is in statistical distance and the goal as in most coding theory goals is um, so you want to maximize rate of the code um, and also there's this additional parameter of epsilon which is the closeness to this distribution df. And also you hope to handle more general, you know, the most general classes of functions as general a class of function, tampering functions as you can. Um, there has been like, you know, lots of recent work on non-malleable codes. Um, it's beyond this five minute talk. And I'll just be focusing on explicit constructions in the information theoretic model. And there's a bunch of applications that non malleable codes are found to different areas of cryptography. And in 2014, this really nice um, theorem that Jarek Chen Gurst for me proved was that as long as your family is not the class of all functions, it's bounded in size, doubly exponential, but this by a parameter delta, there exists, of course, non explicitly um, really good non malleable codes, um, constant rate, actually, Rick uh, approaching one. All right, um, so what about um, explicit constructions? Um, so one model which has been mm -hmm. really popular is this um, split state model where you can think of the code word as being stored and say in, it's partition and each partition is stored in a server maybe and each partition is arbitrarily tampered. So you allow F1 through FL to be arbitrary, tamp arbitrary functions. And a huge line of work on this has now got almost the best you can hope to. You cannot hope for a one split state model. So two split state model, 
um, concentrate and negligible error. So, <coughs> so, so as, sorry. Um, so all this says is that, you know, in, in the model where the code word is partitioned, we do have really excellent non manual codes. So one could ask, what about more global tampering models where each, where you allow the functions to actually look at all the bits of the code word? Well, there has been some work on this as well. Um, so some complexity theory models like, you know, small, small depth circuits, local functions, linear functions, recently some polynomials and so on. And so this is the focus of our work. Um, can we handle more general forms of global tampering? And um, so, I'll, so our work gives two new constructions in two different models. Okay, so to motivate the first model, let's recall this two split state model where you're given a code word and you partition it into two parts and you allow the first function to arbitrarily tamper, the second function to arbitrarily tamper. Our first tampering model is called as the interleaved split state model, which generalizes the you know, two split state model in the following way that you now no longer know the partition. All right, there's still an underlying partition. So the first function F1 acts on some unknown n bits of the two n bits, F2 acts on the remaining n bits, but you do not know what the partition is. Well, this clearly generalizes um, the known partition model and well, you know, this is going beyond the known partition model, which is what we wanted to. And also there are some natural scenarios where you can motivate where, you know, maybe the shares are on servers on a network and they're trying to, they, they use a common channel to communicate the tampered code word. Then you could possibly think of a scenario where it's um, in an arbitrarily interleaved order. And this, okay. So, and our main result is, um, an explicit construction with negligible error and rate, which is vanishing. Um, okay, so this is the first explicit construction in this model. And this question was actually asked um, by Chirakchi and Guruswami, and this is a progress um, towards this open problem. And I'll leave it as an open question to improve the parameters of this, of this construction. In particular, it would be great to have constant rate. All right, so what's our second tampering model? Well, this is, um, okay, so we look at compositions of tamperings of uh, function families. So let F and G be any two tampering classes and F composed with G is uh, defined in the usual way that you first take a function from G and tamper the code word and then pick a function from F and tamper it. Um, Okay, so this is a gen. This is a natural way of um, going to more powerful classes of uh, adversaries and compositions of functions have been heavily studied in other areas of theoretical computer science as well, like communication complexity and uh, complexity theory and so on. And our result here is for a very for very specific uh, classes, which is um, first you apply a linear function, and then you apply this interleaved split state. And we give uh, an explicit construction in this uh, composition of these two particular classes. So more pictorially, you have this code word. First, you apply a global round of tampering, which is <clears throat> linear functions over F2. And then you apply F1 and F2, where you do not know the partition. All right. And this is the first, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first such construction um, for non-trivial classes. In fact, even if you replace F with just split state, no such construction was known. Um, this captures pretty powerful classes of global tampering. Um, and we hope this is a conceptual uh, contribution that, you know, we start the study of non-malleable codes with respect to composition. And an open question here is, um, can you come up with more uh, general ways of constructing non-malleable codes for composition, say given non-malleable codes for the individual families of tampering? 
And it turns out our methods do not even work if you reverse the order of tampering. All right. And um, so I'll leave, I'll end my talk, uh, this five minute talk with open questions, which I'll uh, leave open. And I'll just say that um, our techniques, so the heavy lifting of our techniques actually go on in on extractors, um, non-malleable extractors. So there's, there has been a bunch of uh, recent works um, on constructing non-malleable extractors and we heavily use frameworks which were built in previous works and extend them and we build non-malleable extractors which using beautiful connections um, imply non-malleable codes and also give results for non-malleable secret share. Thanks. Thanks, Ashok. Sure. Uh, are, are your so your all, all your results are over um, binary field, right? Uh, or I mean, in particular, these linear maps, if I remember correctly, they are. Binary or yes, yeah, they're yeah, they're all over F2. In fact, so as an application, we give um, this non malleable uh, secret sharing where uh, the secret it the size it, it's over binary, so the shares are over F2. Uh, hi, um, is it possible for you to do like unequal partition sizes? How hard is the barrier there? Right, um, that's a good question. If I recall it correctly, you can uh, you can extend our constructions to um, unequal sizes as long as I think um, the partition is not too extreme in the sense um, you can split maybe the code word into like n power delta and n minus n power delta for some uh, some constant delta, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, sure. Mm, yeah. I don't see any other questions, so maybe we can just go to the last talk. Um, so Amos, if you can. Uh, so the last talk is by Amos Weimel, uh, Iftach Heidner, uh, Kobe Nissim, and uh, Uri Stemmer. And it's, uh, the, the title is On the Round Complexity of the Shuffle Model. Good, uh, good day, wherever you are. Uh, I want to thank the organizers and uh, one second, I have uh, some echo. I want to thank all the organizers and the program committee and program chair for organizing this lovely TCC uh, conference. And I hope that the next uh, TCC will be going to be virtual and we will be able to see you live. So uh, in this talk about, or talk about the round complexity of the shuffle model of differential privacy. So let's uh, start by defining the model, models of uh, differential privacy. So first, uh, the differential privacy is uh, we have a curator we have who uh, which has the information of individuals and they apply some uh, differentially private algorithm and the guarantee is that uh, if the curator uses the differentially private algorithm to output some useful uh, statistic then the output tells almost nothing about anything in individual i won't go into details of uh, defining the equations that uh, uh, governs this uh, defense privacy. If you listen today to Katrina's uh, lovely talk, you, will, you saw the details. So this uh, is the definition of the differential privacy and it assumes the central model. So in this model, the, the users, the users give the information to the curator and the curator applies the, the uh, differentially private algorithm and the output of the algorithm, which is published to the work, protects the privacy of the individuals. However, 
the curator lives in everything, and all users must trust the curator. So this is a one model. On the other extreme, there's a local model in which the user, each user retains it, it, its uh, information, and uh, users, uh, users apply some uh, differentially private uh, algorithm to the inputs, and, the, and there's no trust in anybody. Everybody has to trust it, itself. But uh, it probably has less uh, accuracy, and we, uh, what can be done in the local model is much less than what can be done in a central model. So this is a local model. So we have two models, which each one has an advantage and a disadvantage. And uh, recently, there's been a model uh, in between these two models. So this is a shuffle model. Again, in the shuffle model, there are users, and each user applies a, a, randomized, a randomized function to its input. However, these inputs, these messages do not go directly to the curator. So there's a, uh, now there's a, some shuffle that shuffles the, these messages, and the curator gets some uh, permutation of, of these messages, and, it, and the curator cannot uh, know which uh, part of sent which uh, message. So this is a shuffle model, and uh, this uh, shuffle model, uh, you have uh, the parties, have, the users uh, need uh, less trust to give, give less trust to the creator, they have to trust uh, the shuffle. However, uh, for some uh, functionalities, you can do much be better than you can do in the local model. So, as I said, this model is uh, somewhere between these two models. And this uh, work we will consider the protocol in this model will consider uh, a multi round protocol in this model. So the protocol uh, proceeds in bounds. In each round, uh, each user sends L messages for the shuffle. The shuffle gets N times L messages and shuffles them and gives them to the curator and so on. So this proceeds for our round. And we require a more, a more cryptographic uh, definition that the view of every T part is in this uh, protocol preserve differential privacy. And, uh, and we also assume that the parties are semi-honest, the parties follow the, follow the protocol that they're supposed to send message according to. And this is a shuffle model uh, for differentially private that uh, was uh, defined uh, two or three years ago, but uh, actually, this model was uh, defined a uh, long time ago by Shai Kushlevitos, Vosky, and Sahai in the ICOS paper. They presented a model where the parties uh, use uh, anonymized uh, messages. The party sends messages for a shuffle uh, network that uh, randomly permutes uh, the messages. And they uh, the ICOS paper had uh, quite a few results. And the result implies that uh, general uh, semi-honest MPC can be implemented in the shuffle model using a constant number of rounds. So what are our results? So prior work in DP in the shuffle model uh, considered the one-round protocol. And we are, one, uh, we are the first to formally start the one complexity in the shuffle model of a differentially private algorithm. Uh, we have both uh, positive and negative results. We present generic MPC uh, results showing that any finite functionality can be computing using two rounds, assuming an honest majority. So every function can be computed in two rounds. And in uh, particular, every central, every functionality that can be uh, computed in the central model uh, of uh, the differential privacy can be computed uh, in two rounds, assuming honest majority. So this is, so you don't need, if you assume honest majority, you don't need more than two rounds. And uh, we also present some impossibility results for one round protocols, showing that uh, two rounds are stronger than uh, one round in differential privacy. So I won't go into the, the details of our results anymore. You can see the full uh, talk or the paper for more details. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, any questions? Mm. 
Um, so I I had a question because I was watching the the, the full talk and um, when you have this this um, um, say protocol to to send uh, to send a message to uh, another party. Um, I guess that that that's generalizing that to sending uh, this, the same message to different parties that that should not be difficult, right? Um, but I was I was basically wondering if if, uh, if say you have a sender that is uh, um, malicious, uh, can you sort of implement some kind of broadcast there, like a malicious sender sends a say a, a message and uh, you have like you know, a subset of of, of parties that that want to uh, receive that message um, in in this uh, shuffle model. I mean, um. so uh, it's not clear exactly what uh, can be done in the shuffle model. In our protocol, each uh, we have a sender and a receiver. Each other party can uh, prevent the sending of messages. It can send messages mm -hmm. that. Uh, well, we, we don't know which one sent the message and it will prevent them sending messages. I think you, uh, since you don't have identities in the shuffle model, uh, you need some extra assumptions uh, or it's mm. not clear exactly. Uh, and this is uh, for the MPC uh, scenario. For differentially private uh, protocols, I'm not sure how to define the protocols in the malicious model. It's a big uh, open problem which uh, I don't know how to tackle. I thought about it and uh, we thought about it and we don't know how to define the, to define it. Elaine mm -hmm. uh, has asked you to uh, expand a little bit on the techniques possible. Okay, so uh, for the positive results, uh, we show, uh, we give it a simple, uh, protocol in which uh, one party can send a message to the other party in one round. Uh, and then uh, we use the protocol of ABT in the information theoretic MPC protocol in two rounds and we can, can simulate it in the, using, the, using the shuffle model for, to, uh, for the, to simulate the, the, the private channel. And to uh, achieve the random uh, sending one message in one round, we take the protocol of uh, ICOS and we modify it uh, using some hash functions such that uh, it's a key exchange where the sender will know the key in advance. So we can, uh, at the same time, it knows the keys in advance. So it uh, can uh, uh, send uh, exchange messages and use the message, uh, the key to send the message. For the lower bound, we use the uh, various techniques to argue that uh, things cannot be proved in uh, one round. Uh, not, can, uh, not can be done in one round uh, using uh, entropy and other techniques. Thanks, Amos. I guess, I guess I would ask a, a very open-ended question. What is your personal feeling about this model? It's the shuffle model has received a lot of popularity. I think it's undebatable how practical implementing shuffles is. Uh, someone who works a lot on non-interactive MPC and stuff like this. Do you think that this is a, a good model uh, in terms of implementing distributed DP or, I don't know, just open-ended. Isn't, isn't it just a permutation, the shuffle model ultimately? Even it's though a you permutation. Have yes, uh, okay. So uh, I'm not sure what I believe about this model. So uh, in this model, you, instead of trusting the curator, you have to trust the, the shuffle. So of course you can, uh, uh, perform the shuffle using an MPC, a simple MPC protocol, then you won't need uh, any uh, to trust anybody. But that I'm not sure how it will be efficient. Or you two different, use... or or two different unkeyed hash functions, each uh, operating on one of the two halves, and then a way of distributing their outputs. Right. 
So you can use it. Uh, do yes, you can uh, use the full shuffling uh, agents yeah, to yeah. do that, and you'll have to trust that at least one of them is honest. But uh, so uh, I can see uh, more trusty implementations of this uh, uh, model. I'm not sure uh, exactly the company that uh, compl uh, implements this protocol, how they, uh, who does the shuffle, and uh, I haven't seen the details to show, say if I trust the implementation. Uh, it's not a... Uh, I'd, even, I'd even bet that it either needs a power of two shares or a prime number of shares. I, I'm not sure. I, I would say that they'll probably do it uh, using a different uh, server on their machine. So even if they use a different server to do the shuffle and not everybody has access to that, that prevents uh, attack from inside the people. So it has its advantages and uh, certainly it has much more utility than the local model. The local model uh, is very restricted. Oh yeah, so, because, uh, yeah, right. Who knows what's at the edge? I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, uh, do you think that there's maybe a, a better suited sort of uh, black box MPC primitive uh, to study or something like this? I mean, obviously, like, yeah, anonymous communication is very natural and well suited to this differentially private setting. But I was just wondering if you thought maybe there's some alternative. Uh, so you know. actually, the saying that you do a permutation it's uh, overkill. You can you simply uh, can uh, output the messages in some canonical uh, order. It's not uh, if it's a permutation you can order it. Uh, so it's uh, you have to take the messages and uh, order them in some canonical order. Give a histogram of the messages of some something like that. That is equivalent uh, definition to to the shuffle model, which is. Uh, the randomness is not used. It's not used and it doesn't give anything. So uh, the question uh, is, uh, if, if, you had a the time, if you had a time code associated with a UTC, which is cryptographically generated based on who knows what, um, that'd be a pretty good timestamp, right? And if you use that as a key for a hash function to compute the two different code words, uh, but still the mixing, still the mixing. I, the mix, the shuffle is a permutation, right? Yeah, so you have to disassociate the messages from uh, the people that send them, so, uh, yeah. So I think Anyhow, it's a good, interesting. I, yeah, nice idea, very nice idea. Doesn't some, so, didn't like some of the works use like the sample instead of a uh, shuffle? Like what's understood like, um, like would would sampling be a an alternative like to this permutation? So shuffling a sampling of uh, inputs uh, takes some uh, algorithm that is, is already epsilon differential epsilon delta differential private and uh, increase and makes it more private, but it uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't start with the. Uh, you need uh, something that is differentially private and it doesn't, it's not suffice to get uh, differentially private. It will only increase but, the power method. But there the randomness helps, the sampling randomness. We are seeing in the permutation, in the shuffle model, the randomness is not helping the, the DP? In the, in the, no, it's simply, uh, the random permutation can be uh, simulated from the, the histogram and vice versa. So it's a, it's nice for that's the way the protocol the model was the, presented, but the, it's actually not you. It doesn't have any power the the, the random permutation. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, thanks for the 35 brave uh, people that stayed until the end of the TTT. <laughs> and thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um,
And I hope to see you next year in Raleigh. Physically. <laughs> Same.